All right, for this problem, we have a throttle lever, and this throttle lever is being actuated by a throttle cable. Uh, somehow we have been able to determine that there will be a friction force between the throttle cable and the sheath that carries it of uh, 2.6 pounds. And what you want to do is you want to design this return spring on your throttle lever uh, so that it can still return the throttle lever back to its original position when it has to pull against that frictional force in the throttle cable. Uh, but you don't actually have the ability to control, or we're not making this part of the problem, the ability to control the amount of force in the spring. Instead, you're trying to figure out how to do this just by changing one dimension on this throttle lever. And that dimension is uh, marked as dimension D on the figure. So you're imagining here, how would I change dimension D on this figure so that I could make this throttle lever uh, overcome the force of friction in the cable. Okay, how do you suggest we start? Okay, a free body diagram is probably a good place to start. All right, of what? Okay, maybe the throttle lever itself would be a good place to do this. And what I'm gonna do is show this as a, you know, I guess I'll try to draw it somewhat correctly. Something like this, and something like this. I've got a little point down here. Okay, close enough. Uh, what kind of forces, I've, so I've isolated the body, right? That's always our first step is isolate the body. So I've done that. What sorts of forces are applied to this body? Okay, I've got a force in the throttle cable. And that comes off tangentially off of the throttle lever that has a radius of R. Okay, um, do I have a value for that force? Okay. This is basically the force in the cable. If you think about the other side of the force in the cable, so let me kind of draw the end of the cable over here. This is the cable, right? What force is applied in the cable as a result of this throttle lever pulling on it? Right, it goes this way, right? So I wanna make sure that we're clear on this idea that we've got this tension in this cable. The force that I'm showing on the lever is the force applied to the lever by the cable. The force I'm showing on the cable is the force applied to the cable by the lever. Does that make sense? So we make sure we understand how these two things interact with each other. What was this force we had to pull with in the, uh, on the cable to make it slide in the sheath? Okay, this was 2.6 pounds. So what should this value be up here? 2.6 pounds. All right, so there's that much. What else should we do? What other forces are applied to the throttle lever? Okay, we've got this force in the spring, and this spring is going to be carrying a tensile force, so I'm gonna show it again as a tensile force applied to that lever by the same logic I used on my little uh, return cable. That force should be pulling you know, toward the connection point of the return spring, right? And that's the effect that the spring causes on the throttle lever, okay? Do I know the value of that force? Okay, 1.7 pounds. Okay, do I know anything else about um, any of the, you know, anything else that I need to know on here? Okay, so point A is where I have uh, rotation happening. It is a pin kind of a connection right there. And so I would say, that we should apply our normal constraints like we would to any pin to reactions that essentially say that point is not allowed to translate left and right and it's not allowed to translate up and down. And I'll call this RAX and I'll call this RAY. Okay, I've sort of done it already but I've sort of started to imply a coordinate system just by those names. So let me go ahead and put that on here as well. 
put a Y up here, and I'll go way out here and show X just to kind of keep it out of the mess. All right, so that's pretty good so far. Uh, any other forces that we should consider of being applied to the throttle lever? Anything? Should we do self-weight? What's our guideline for to thinking about self-weight? If it doesn't give you any, inf any information about what it might be, then you can pretty much safely ignore it when it comes to doing exam problems, okay? All right, so what else do I need as information on my diagram here? Okay, I need to know some directions, right? The direction of, of particularly one of my forces is important, this 1.7 pounds. And I'm gonna show you here, we haven't done a lot of this yet in, uh, in this class, but I'm gonna show you that one of the ways that you can specify the direction of a force is instead of using an angle, you can use a slope. And a slope is a rise over a run, and one way of showing that on your figure is to just show, I kind of usually call it a slope indicator, but it uh, just shows rise and run for a particular direction. So what would the rise and run be for one, the 1 1.7 pound force right there? Okay, so it has a run of A plus B, and I know those two values, right? So A is 0.6 inches. These, the, I have these uh, length values shown down here. So I have 0.6 plus 2.8 would give me what? 3.4, right? Okay, and I, I a lot of times do drop the units whenever I'm doing these slope indicators as long as they have the same units because if they're the same units, then slope, rise over run, the units drop out, right? So anyway, you were saying the rise is going to be what? Ah, so what we want for the rise is basically this little length right here, right? We know one of those values is C, which is 0.9, but what about D? D is what we're supposed to find. So what should I do? Okay. It's still going to be D minus C. I just don't know D. So why don't I go ahead and write it down here as D minus, and then I'll go ahead and put in my value for C, 0.9. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe. All right. So what we want to do next is we want to identify anything else that matters here. Like, how do you decide what matters? Maybe that's a good question. Okay. You try to think forward to the kind of equation that you're thinking about writing, right? So what kind of equation do you think we might be thinking about writing for this problem? Okay, probably a moment equation might be a good place to think about. Where would you might want to take your moments about? Okay, point A is probably a good guess. It's where we have a pin. If we take moments around that point, we can eliminate those two unknowns, RAX and RAY, and so that's helpful. Okay, so if we're taking moments around point A, then what other information would be helpful on this diagram? Okay, we could put the angle of the throttle cable on here if we want, 23 degrees. Okay. Anything else? What about the radius of this curved surface that the throttle cable is attached to? Would that be helpful? Okay, what is that value? Okay, we've got this 0.75 value right here. So 
three quarters of an inch. What else might be helpful? How, do, how are we going to evaluate our moment of the 1.7 pound force applied down there at point B? Okay. What I would say is we're going to have to figure out that moment, right? Which means our typical technique we do for that is we split the force into components. We take the vertical component and multiply by what? Horizontal distance. You take the horizontal component and multiply by what? Vertical distance. So it might be helpful for me to think about putting a vertical distance from point A down to point B. And what is that value? Okay. All the way down to point B would be, would be dimension D, right? And I don't know that yet, but I'll go ahead and write it on here as a variable. What about my horizontal distance from point A to point B? Okay, that's going to be dimension A, which I know is 0.6 inches. All right, and I think I have listed out everything that would matter for this free body diagram. What do I do next? Okay, this is my FBD. What do we write off of FBDs? Okay, equilibrium equations. At least while we're doing statics, we do equilibrium equations. Okay, when you get to dynamics, you'll do what are called equations of motion. But for now, we'll do equilibrium equations. And uh, specifically, we have one in mind. What is that? A moment equation. So we're going to sum moments around point A, and as I do this sum, I'm going to assume counterclockwise is positive, just so that I remain consistent as I write my sum. Okay? So what forces do I have that cause moments around point A for this throttle lever? Okay, I have 1.7 pounds, right? 1.7 pounds, but I have two components of that force, right? What are my two components? Okay, I have X and Y. How do I, how do I split that 1.7 pounds into components? Okay, yeah, there's this technique you can do where you kind of think of the slope indicator as a triangle, and you think about the little angle of that triangle you can think of those angles as sort of being opposite over hypotenuse or adjacent over hypotenuse, which are the definition of sine and cosine. And, uh, you know, based on that, if I want, say, the horizontal component of the 1.7 pound force, all I have to do is take that run of 3.4 and divide it by the length of the hypotenuse, which is going to be 3.4 squared plus d minus 0.9 squared. And that gives me my horizontal component of, uh, of force. What do I multiply that by to get a moment around A? What? Okay. Horizontal component multiplied by vertical length, right? Vertical distance. And so my vertical distance there is D. So my next question here is, um, you know, do I have the sign correct for that force? I see some nods. Do you all agree? Okay because that horizontal force is going to tend to do a counterclockwise rotation around point uh, A. All right, what term should I do next, maybe? Okay, maybe the Y component of the 1.7 pound. So 1.7 pounds times, now I need the vertical piece, which I'm going to need to take D minus 0.9 over uh, 3.4 
squared, oh, this is square root of 3.4 squared plus d minus 0.9 squared. And that gets multiplied by what? Point six inches. Okay. Now I'll ask the same question for this one. Do I have the direction correct? Right now I've got it as a positive, at least if I don't put anything specific. Should it be positive or negative? Okay. Think about this real carefully. We had a force like this was our first, our horizontal component. And you said that made a counterclockwise rotation around A. This next one is a vertical component. Does that create a clockwise or counterclockwise tendency to rotate around A? Clockwise. So you want to make sure you don't mess this up. That one should be a negative value because it's clockwise. Okay. Then what? Okay. From the throttle cable, does it tend to rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. So we say minus 2.6 pounds. Now I could split it into components, but do I really need to? Okay. Would you say that this line and this line are already perpendicular to each other? Based on the fact that that's a circular surface that that cable is riding on, and uh, we're just pulling tangentially to that surface, we are already perpendicular right there. So all we have to do is take our 2.6 pounds and multiply by 0.75 inches. Okay, and that takes care of that entire effect of the 2.6 pound force. All right, so now what? Okay, set this equal to zero, and now we need to solve for D, which looks a little scary unless you have good tools to use. Okay, so let me show you what tool I recommend that you think about using. You can type this whole equation right into your calculator and just have it solve, right? So I'll put in 1.7 times, all right, we'll do here 3.4. I'll go ahead and put also my D. Instead of using D, I'm going to use a variable X. That's how the calculator's set up. It wants me to use a variable X. Okay, so I've done sort of the numerator side of this first term. Okay, in the denominator, I can put in 3.4 squared uh, plus, okay, in this spot, I'm going to put X minus 0.9, okay? Now my next term, I'll do minus 1.7 times, here I'll do uh, x again, uh, minus 0.9. This is gonna get multiplied by 0.6, and all of this will be divided by the square root of 3.4 squared, uh, plus 0.9. d minus, okay, instead of d, I'll use x, d minus uh, 0.9, and that value is also squared. And then for my last term, I'll put in uh, 2.6, whoops, what do I need to do? Minus 2.6 times 0.75. And that's my whole equation. Now I need an equal sign. If you're using a Casio, you get an equal sign by hitting alpha, and then you'll see right above the calc key, there's an equal right there. So that's how you get the equal sign. And you then set that equal to zero. Um, now we are ready to have the calculator solve. Don't be tempted to hit the equal button right now down here at the bottom, which you want to do instead is you want to choose solve above the calc key right here. So to get that, you hit shift solve. What it typically does is it starts by giving you a guess value. 
Um, my question for you, is this a linear system, or, or excuse me, not a linear system, but a linear equation or a nonlinear? Okay, it's nonlinear, which means your initial guess matters. So it might not be good for me to just let any old guess be here. So if you want to use a different guess besides the value that was already stored in X for whatever reason, you can just enter it right here. And I just used one because I'm using inches, so one inch seemed like a relatively good guess for something like this. And have it solve, and it says 1.206 or so uh, inches. Okay, and hopefully that is one of the choices, and it is. So to just recap a little bit, this is a, it, there's nothing different about this problem other than the variable that you are solving for, right? This is probably not something you're used to have seeing, you're used to, have, you know, been seeing maybe in your homework or whatever, solving for a different variable, uh, but it's certainly something that's possible. All right. Questions on this one? Uh, so the question is, could you do this problem if you didn't have that function on your calculator? The answer is you probably could, but it would be a little bit of a mess and there'd be a lot of algebraic manipulation that you would have to do. Um, now, since it's, you know, since this is a multiple choice, one of the, the, uh, techniques you could use is once you've got the equation set up, you could guess and check. Right? You could literally take all 10 of the possible choices, plug each one of them in and see which one of them worked. Right? I don't recommend that as a general solution strategy, but I would say that might be easier. Who knows? Might be easier, might not be, but might be easier than trying to manipulate the algebra to figure out D. Okay. Other questions? Cool.